All right, Cravens here because we're going to talk some UTEP football. Picks up. How many times did you make it out to El Paso? Just one? Just once. Just for the for UTSA the, game? For the UTSA game. Ironically, the only game they lost at home this year. Five and one at mm. home. So the you're Miners. the bad luck. So it's, oh, well. Maybe UTSA is the bad luck. Yeah. Which I guess Ooh, the the bad luck walking through the walk through the door. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, so let's talk. Let's first and foremost take a, a, a grand look at, at things at, at, at UTEP because I think coming into the year, and it's easy to say this because they've just been one of the more moribund programs, arguably the most moribund program in Texas college football. Um, in the FBS ranks are released uh, to go and to to do that, what they were able to do, and to make a bowl to finish six and seven was the final. Yep, final tally to finish six and seven. No, seven and six. Sorry, seven and six. Finish seven and six. Uh, I don't think there's any other way to describe it besides pretty remarkable. We can certainly argue with who they beat, and 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 the schedule was certainly favorable. But when you're UTEP, I feel like you're not asking how; you're asking how many. Yeah, I mean, you, we have to remember this is a program that won zero games in 2017, one game in 2018, one game in 2019, Jeez. three games in 2020. So they had won five games in yeah. the last four years entering this year. And they, to start out 6-1 and one was tremendous. They beat the teams they were supposed to beat. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what you can do at UTEP, right? We're not – we shouldn't put – UTEP, it's almost like Rice when we're talking about yeah. like there there are expectations and you have to measure these teams against their expectations. And if you're UTEP, going to a bowl game is tremendous. Like if they went to a bowl game next year, for example, it would only be the second time since the fifties they've gone to consecutive bowl games. Well, so this is the type of program we're talking about. Dana Dimmels had to build this from the absolute ground up. And I'm I was excited for you know the guys who stuck through those years right if you were there at 18 19 2020 because we got to remember the pandemic hit everybody but it hit UTEP the most because nobody wanted to go to El Paso the city mm -hmm. kind of shut down um, and so they only got to play eight games last year so to sit through those kind of one win seasons a, a season that was pretty much taken away from you and then to turn around and reach a bowl game it had to be a cool year to be a minor well and it also it speaks to you know Dana Dimmel and and credit to and I can't believe I'm saying this at this point but like credit to the UTEP brass for sticking with them because I know we were having the conversations of like well you just got to move on you got to get get out there and I think that they they looked at him and said all right we trust that you're building something. It's going to take a minute to get there, and sure enough, it came out of the slow cooker, and it was it was good to go, and 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 the one of the best years in, in recent program history. You know, it's funny. So people who remember Dana Dimmel's story, he was at Houston for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and they got rid of him pretty quickly. He had a pretty two quick, years maybe. Yeah, he had a quick. He finally felt like he was getting that turnaround, and he got fired. When he got interviewed for the UTEP job, he told Jim Center, the the AD there. I don't I don't want to hear from you for four years. Yeah. Like if I'm gonna take this job, I don't I need four years before anybody's critiquing me about on field product. That's smart. And this was year three, right? Or mm -hmm. no. Year four. Year four. So mm -hmm. this was the year to kind of rubber to road and he did exactly what he was gonna do or said he was gonna do. You know, he's from that Bill Snyder tree. He's watched, you know, maybe the best program builder in college football over the last 10, 15, 20 years and so uh, he did some some of the same things. A lot of those best players were JUCO guys um, who came in and kind of gave them instant uh, impact. And so, yeah, a really good year for for UTEP and a program who trusted their coach and let him do it the right way. And we're starting to see the results. I think that's something that maybe more colleges um, could take into account because everybody wants to be like Oklahoma, where you just of like course. drop in a coach and win ten games and. There's not there's ten programs you can do that at, mm -hmm. you know. UTEP's clearly not one of them. So credit to them for kind of doing it the right way, the patient way, and I think it will turn into more years like this. Uh, all right, let's talk about the offense. Uh, let's hand out a grade on the offensive side for uh, for for the miners. And um, you know, remember this was this was the side of the ball, especially recently, that had really been stuck in the mud. They could not figure anything out offensively. Uh, I would say a breakout year for them. Um, you give them a B minus. I do, and again, we're grading this compared to their competition and their level, right? Yeah. Um, you know, Hardison, their quarter, Gavin Hardison, their quarterback, broke a record with 3,200 passing yards. Jacob Cowing was excellent, maybe the best wide receiver in the state. 69 catches for 1,354, 
seven touchdowns. That's nineteen point six two yards per catch, and mm. so uh, really good. They just they were kind of boom or bust. That was the problem with their offense. They were either scoring on like three, four play drives with big plays, or they were going three and out. There wasn't a lot there in the in the middle, and that was because of the run offense. The reason I didn't give them an A is because they only averaged three point eight yards per rush, and so. They were in a lot of third and longs. They had to punt a lot. So if Cowing, Justin Garrett, if those guys weren't making big plays early, it ended up being a punt. They're going to have to figure out a way to be more consistent because that will help them on third down, which they were only 31.4% on third down conversions. It will help them in the red zone where they kicked as many field goals as they scored touchdowns. Well, and what's so funny is that passing was not what we expected – Dana Dimmel to come in and install you know he's a you know he was a Bill Snyder guy basically uh, we expected them to run the ball and where you take a look at where they had recruited well where they had kind of won their recruiting battles had been at running back right Ronald Awad and, and Deion Hankins and, and Q Wadley you know those guys to get them in there was and so that's what made it all the more I think exciting is the fact that you did have a guy in Jacob Cowing who, or Gavin Harrison rather who stepped up and a guy in Jacob Cowing who stepped up to form a certified full on dangerous passing offense for the first time in forever. I mean, first time in a long, long time. Right. It looked like a modern offense. Exactly right. Yeah. And, and that's not something that maybe we would have expected from UTEP. Some of that's recruiting. And then, they, you know, they were just kind of injured at running back. Like the mm -hmm. two guys you mentioned there with a Watt and Hankins, like, I think they only played four games together. You know, mm. one of them was kind of always dinged up. Hankins early in the season, a Watt towards the end of the season. So they just never got consistent running game. And some of that's the offensive line too, mm -hmm. right? Um, they, they allowed a decent amount of sacks. Hardison had to get the ball out uh, quickly a lot of time. So offensive line, in my opinion, is the hardest place to recruit for schools like UTEP. Yeah. Because there's only – there's a lot of wide receivers in the world. There's even a lot of quarterbacks in the world with the way seven on seven has has blown up and stuff like that. But there's only so many three hundred pound men who can move around yeah. and bully people. Like there's just not that many. Right. And UTEP's low enough on the totem pole to where that doesn't trickle down to them as much. So if they can improve there, I think they have a really good shot of kind of repeating the res results in twenty twenty two. B minus for the for the offense. Let's move over to the defense. And I'm very interested in your grade here because uh, I think that there were certainly you know the defense was not. The defense was better in 2020 than the offense was, but I would even say that they took a pretty clear step forward in 2021, and in a lot of ways, some of those games, you know, we talked about the games that they won, uh, you know, the, the games, you know, you win the games you're supposed to, a lot of them came on the backs of the defense because, you know, there were a couple games there where the offense kind of no-showed and the defense had to stand up, uh, so I'm, I'm interested in, in what you thought of their defense. Yeah, I mean, in their seven wins, they gave up 15.5 points a game. Yeah. In their six losses, they gave up 36.5, <laughs> right? Wow. So, I mean, it, it, it was a 21-point swing, and so mm -hmm. that defense was super important. The offense, as we talked about, just wasn't consistent enough to score a lot of points. They could score some quick points and have some big plays, you know, but they only averaged 25 points a game. So it was a lot up to this defense, and I thought they played really well, especially in the front seven. Breon Hayward, uh, Tyrese Knight, they both end up with over 100 tackles. Um, they have a couple guys uh, on the defensive line that combined for about 15 sacks there, com you know, together. So they were pretty good defensively. The back, the back half uh, struggled a little bit as the competition got better. You know, some wide receivers like a uh, Zakari Franklin at UTSA had a big day and stuff like that. They just didn't have that number one corner. Uh, but the front seven was really good, and when they were supposed to beat teams, right, when they were better than opponents, that defense showed up. But there were some there were some games, you know, against Boise State, against UTSA, uh, where they gave up a pretty decent amount of points. And that's just a talent gap that probably needs a year or two more of recruiting to, to catch up on. Well, and what's so interesting to me is when we talk about a defense that was pretty good, normally you look at the hallmarks like, okay, well, we're going to go. We're going to force a lot of turnovers. They didn't. They, no. they were not – they were not big play oriented. They were just pretty good. They were second in Conference USA in opponents' third down conversions. Like you know, they were you know better than UTSA, right? Who won the conference right. at that at that? And so, what I think is so impressive about them is they won just by being solid across the board. The problem is there were some times where they just weren't, and they just got out talented. And that's when you needed those big splash plays, which just kind of never came along. Yeah, that's kind of the interesting thing about their defense this year. All right. Uh, let's hand out an, uh, an MVP award. Who is the most valuable player on the 2021 UTEP Miners? I mean, I think it's got to be Jacob Cow. I think mm -hmm. I would be very mad if you didn't pick him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think he did win our you know wide receiver of the year after the year. I mean, to average over, almost 20 yards a catch 
for a team that lacked big plays, like we just talked about they lacked big plays defensively, they lacked them offensively as well. If you take Jacob Cowling away, I think they only have 10 plays over 50 yards on mm-hmm. the whole season. He was up so, there in the national ranks. Yeah, Let's, I mean, he's, he's an excellent wide receiver. It, it, it stinks for them that he, you know, entered the transfer portal and is going to go to Arizona. But that that year that he had last year at UTEP is like an all-timer. And he's an Arizona most. guy. He, yep. Yeah, he's, he's yep. from that area. So kind of going home. Um, I mean, you look at the numbers. Uh, so he averaged – he had 105 yards per game receiving. That is better than Jamison Williams. That is better than Garrett Wilson. That's better. Remember the last time you were here, we were talking about uh, Tank Dell at Houston. Yep. Considerably better than Tank Dell. I mean, he was he was their big John Mechie. Considerably better than a lot of these guys, uh, numbers wise. He was their big play offense. Like if they were going to hit a big play, it was going to be through him. And and he stepped up in a big way. I could make an argument that the Cowing Garrett wide receiver duo was mm-hmm. the best one two wide receiver duo in the yeah. state yeah i think that's because like a texas is xavier worthy and no one else houston xavier or uh, tank dell had 58 yeah. more catches than anybody else on the roster right there was smu had a pretty decent um, you know stable of receivers quentin johnson by himself at tcu right there's a lot of single great wide receivers yeah. around the state like who's the second best attack right and right. comma and right miles price yeah and so like smu i think is the only place that maybe had a stable of guys that were better but in terms of just one two punch the best wide receiver duo in the state was at utep i find that to be amazing that is That's pretty wild. amazing all right, so now uh, what have you done for me lately? They haven't won a game in months. Um, That's true. Let's talk about um, 2022 because, you know, you win. Good job. You kind of exceeded everyone's expectations. I think now there's going to be uh, there's going to be an expectation to maintain this. I do wonder, though, about some of the losses that they're going to have and are they going to be able to replicate that, especially what figures to be a more difficult schedule, too. Right. They, they only have two winnable games out of conference, where last year they were going to go 3-1 with that Boise State loss. This year they're going to play Oklahoma and Boise State out of conference. So they're going to need a, a better Conference USA uh, record. They're going to need to do better on the road. They were only 2-5 and five on the road. So they're going to have to improve. I think one of those was in New Mexico, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, they're going to have to uh, do better when they travel. And the thing we don't ever talk about with UTEP is, like, everywhere they travel in conference is a long trip. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, nothing's a short trip. And in them, a different right? time zone. Like they, <laughs> well, and they're only 1-22 in 22 all time in the Eastern time zone. That is That was shocking yeah. to right. me. And so uh, they're going to have to get better at that. But, you know, you look at it this year. They went 4-4 four and four in Conference USA, and two of those losses were on the road by three points. They lost FAU mm-hmm. by three points on the road, or FIU three points on the road, and they lost the three points to North Texas on the road. So, you know, they're right there. I mean, they were very close to having a 9-3 and three regular season. So mm-hmm. if they can replace Cowing, and you're not going to do that with one one guy Mm-mm. they're going to need to get better running the football and build more balance and, and the way that Hardison can improve is by being less boom or bust I think he only had like a 53 percent completion you mm-hmm. know percentage next year so I bet they sure that up a little bit if the defense can be good as well and they can go two and two out of conference I think they got a chance to win four conference games and get to six and six and I think if you're UTEP that's that's where the expectation has to yeah. be. The realistic expectation is we reach a bowl game, and any anything on top of that is gravy. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said earlier, if they reach a bowl game again in 2022, that will only be the second time since the 50s where they've gone consecutive bowl games back-to-back. So that would be a huge accomplishment for Dimmel's crew. You know, the other thing, and, and this is a bigger conversation, we got all offseason to talk about it, but um, obviously with conference realignment coming down the pike, they are in a very tough spot. Um, they're kind of getting left behind there in, in Conference USA. You know, they're going to be joined by teams like Sam Houston, which we're excited about, but then also like New Mexico State, you know, rivalry game during the conference, Jacksonville State, Liberty. Um, it is a a weird look there in Conference USA, but I think that there is a glass half full opportunity there where you can say, all right, why can't you go out there and 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 rise to the top, you know, the, the top echelon of this new look conference USA? Is it a weaker conference? Undoubtedly, right. But why can't you go out there and and become the what Boise State was in the Mountain West for so many years, where they're just out there dominating? Winning speaks to recruits. Yeah, exactly so. right. <laughs> and it's you know there are some things working for El Paso. Like you are mm-hmm. kind of on an island by yourself, and that can be interesting. But the Sun Bowl is tremendous. Like, oh, there's amazing. not a better stadium in the state. And if you add Juarez there, they got about 2 million people yes. in that area to draw upon for advertising money, for fans in the stadiums. And, like, when there's fans at the Sun Bowl, like, it's a great atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And so if they really hit the JUCOs 
in West Texas and New Mexico, Arizona, those type of, of things. And like we talked about with Dimmel and his Bill Snyder connection, he knows how to recruit JUCO. I do think you're right. I think UTEP can kind of become like, you know, what Louisiana or Appalachian State did in the yeah. Sun Belt, you know, where you're you're not going to compete for anything huge, but you can win conference championships and be an eight to ten win team on a regular basis, go to bowl games. And if you look throughout UTEP football history, that would be a tremendous five, ten, fifteen year run. That really well would. And you will be well fed. That Let too. Let me speak <laughs> from personal experience. I just remember I, I um I've told the story before, but I did a story uh, for the magazine about El Paso and um, went out there when Sean Coogler was there, and and he told me he was like he just said straight up he's like our number one like the biggest task for us is just getting kids here. If we get kids here for a visit, they'll look around and be like, oh, this place is actually pretty rad like yeah. it's pretty great yep. um but that's the biggest trouble the biggest trouble is just convincing people to go out there uh but you know good things ahead and if you win then certainly people want to go play for a winner one of our winners here mike craven <laughs> follow him on well twitter done. at craven mike well and done see his final work at texas <laughs> so bad slash recruiting. uh and you guys uh republic of football republic of football got dana holgerson on it'll be Woo! out tomorrow afternoon so check your your Spotify or anywhere that you listen. I, you can clear you can clearly tell I listen to things on Spotify because I, <laughs> yeah. I know I know Spotify, you know. Spotify and then whatever, whatever else there else, is. Whatever else, you nerds. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. No, no, I'm, uh, I'm anti technology. I'm a luddite. <laughs> thanks for stopping by, dude. Right. Thanks so much for watching that video. If you would like more and to be notified when they come out, go ahead and click that subscribe button right down there. You can also watch Texas Football Today every day live at noon on TexasFootball.com, Facebook, Twitch, and right here on YouTube. For more of the best coverage of Texas football in the Lone Star State, go to TexasFootball.com slash subscribe.